Showgirls is a must-see cult movie. Here's five reasons why. Hello there, and welcome back to Enigmatic Retro Rewind. Hey. Right, okay, so today we're doing Showgirls. We are. Yes. <laughs> um, so the reason why we're doing Showgirls is because the next cult film club screening is actually Showgirls. Yes. Um, it's a movie I've been wanting to show for a while. Um, it was an interesting reaction when we did the Battle Royale screening and I mentioned the next movie was Showgirls. Half the audience went, huh? Yeah, Why? but then the other half was like whoops. Whoop. There was a combination <laughs> of whoops and uh, literally. Um, I mean, it, it, it talked briefly before we get into it, we did the Battle Royale screening. And yeah. I think that turned out quite well. It was really good, really nice turnout for it. Yes. And it was interesting actually, because I think people who never saw, saw it for the first time, they saw that movie and they were really, really excited about it. And they, I think, people forgot how dour the movie's ending was. It doesn't mm. end very happily. No, no, it, it, but it, I mean, I was in that camp as well for the first time I was seeing it yeah. on, on, the, on the screen. And I was expecting to be really, I was expecting to be really depressed by it, but it, it, it's a, strangely, it's a really fun movie. The style mm. of it is like satirical, as you said. Yeah. So I, I wasn't sort of like feeling depressed after watching it because there's a lot of, to like, laugh at the movie not laugh at but laugh with, with. yeah so I, I i thoroughly enjoyed the film i'm yeah. glad you did mm. and it's good to see it on the big screen there's a lot and it's a lot of fun it's a movie that i think more people should be watching and it really showed that audience but we need to talk about the movie we're going to be showing next time which is happening very soon which is showgirls my goodness So we've got five reasons, as I said, in the coming up. Yeah, so there's five reasons. But first of all, I would like mm. to put a bit of a caveat on this. Okay. Yeah. So Showgirls, this isn't a good movie. I'm going to put this on the ball now. Mm. It's a must-see movie. Yes. It doesn't necessarily mean this movie is good. It's in the same realm as... When, when we used to do the Trash Tapes podcast. This mm. is the perfect movie to fit in there. It's yeah. a movie that's so bad it's good. Mm. And so our recommendations are ways to say, uh, things that we thought that were, but were genuinely both good and kind of funny because of how so bad is good it is. Yeah. So let's start off with some good. Mm. Number one, we need to talk about Paul Verhoeven. Yes. So this movie has a whole bunch of style. Right? It's very, very stylish. And Paul Verhoeven is probably the kind of the weird thing, kind of the right person for it. Because he does have that sense of style in all of his movies. I love women. And I think I, I have the feeling that I express myself better in women than in men. I'm really a guy who loves to drink a coffee, cup of coffee with a woman instead of sitting in the bar with a guy and drinking whiskey, you know? I've always felt like that. So you look at things like Basic Instinct, Robocop, uh, Starship Troopers. You look at all of his films like that and there's style, which really shows in this movie. It's like, well, it's... It's a stylish way of doing sleaze, isn't it? Mm. In, in a funny way. <laughs> and he does that pretty well. Yeah. If you look at all of his films, he has a very good way of stylizing sleaze. Mm. And so Showgirls is about the underbelly of Vegas. And so why not have that style? You can almost see it also has this over-the-top level of camp, yeah. which works really well with this movie because just looking at the dance sequences in this movie, yeah, it, the, the sets are bombastic, the lights are ridiculous, the colours are over the top, there's sequins everywhere. Mm. And it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, so it really works because you have this director who is known for a very particular style putting it into this movie, which if you look at his sort of filmography, it feels like a weird choice. Yeah, I mean, I, d I remember thinking, I mean, I had, obviously, this is the kind of movie, a lot of his movies, you see him before you should see them as, yeah. a, as a kid. And I remember, I, obviously, I'd seen, for some reason, I'd seen Basic Instinct, <laughs> like, at that age. Like, I was, I was a really young, t I was, like, about 13 or something, around, around about this sort of time. But I'd seen uh, Basic Instinct mm. somewhere, I, I saw it at a friend's house. And I thought, because I knew it was Paul Verhoeven, yeah. like this movie, I was thinking, wow, I've seen basic things, and that was sexy and cool and edgy. And like, and I was thinking, this is going to be for, is, is, is the right man for the job, basically. Yeah. 
but surprisingly, it doesn't deliver in that respect. Like It's weird, but is it because of the style? Is directorial style just not matching the script or vice versa? So we're going to get into that, I think. Yeah. But it's like this, the dance sequences. There's a whole bunch of, the dance sequences are really, really stylish. Mm. There's a high level of camp and it's fun because of that. Yeah. Whether we think or not, whether the movie's good is a different question altogether, but it's it's got its style and I think it works to that extent. But I wouldn't necessarily say that you go to see this movie because it's a Paul Hope for Home movie. That's not one of the main plus yeah. points, is it? I don't think. There's an expectation with a Paul Verhoeven yeah. movie. And I don't mm. think this movie ever really reaches that, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Another standout, which mm. is number two. Let's move on to two. Okay. We need to talk about our lead. We need to talk about Elizabeth Berkeley. So, obviously, she was made famous by Saved by the Bell. Jesse, You can't sing the night! Yes, I can! I'm so excited! I'm so excited! I'm so... <laughs> scared! I'm so excited, I just can't hide it. Yeah. Ah, so, sorry. a lot of her fan base <laughs> was Saved by the Bell. Yes. She went straight from that to this. And the sad thing about it, because I, I remember like reading up about this, about mm. her, she fought for this role. Yeah. She fought like Nomi <laughs> for this part. <laughs> yes. 20 years ago, I had this huge dream to play this girl named Nomi Malone. Yeah! And a script landed in my lap. Well, not really. I sought it out. I fought for it. I did everything Nomi would do. And like, well, her agent was saying, no, you're not gonna, they're not gonna give it to you because they're gonna give it to X, Y, and Z, like these got, like, bigger stars. Yes. So she fought for it and then this happened. It feels like, yeah, it, yeah, and she fought for it for a movie that now is now infamous rather than made her a star. This yes. movie kind of completely halted her trajectory into being a film star because she mm. was just nothing but television. Uh, but I'll say this though, whether you agree with her performance or not, she is the only person in the whole movie, really, that's putting effort and energy into it. Where are you from? Back east. From where back east? Different places. Basically, she's doing what's on the page. Yes. The, the, the script is a, is a problem we'll get to. Yeah. But like, I think, I don't think you can blame like the, you know, everything on her, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's not her fault the movie's bad. The she was doing a, a good job. She was, yeah. <laughs> according to what was like scripted and directed. Like. Yes, and that's the thing is, she, she did what, I think she did exactly what she said on the tin, and mm. because of that, she stands out in a way that is beautiful, right? <laughs> Elizabeth, darling, too much hands, not enough hips. Can I just show you? One, two, three, four, I'm dancing from my vagina. One, two, three, four, I'm grinding, I'm grinding. Orgasmize, orgasmize, and we're done. And she has an energy to it. And you can see, for example, when she dances, she dances like she's punching people. She has energy, she's sparse. Every time she speaks, she sounds like she's putting 125%, while everyone else in the room is doing 50. Yeah. So this is probably the reason why people are noticing her performance more than anyone else's, because everyone else is sleepwalking. She puts everything into it and more, probably more than anyone expected. Yeah. And maybe because of the story, like with Paul Verhoeven, there's been stories about whether or not she, he genuinely wanted to make this movie or not, or whether everyone else around him didn't really care, but she yeah. really went full into it. And she's embraced it now in her older age. In fact, she's become almost like this, she's, Unlike some other like cult film stars who mm. kind of like, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to be associated with this. She's 100% on board. I know, I watched a video with her pre uh, presenting the 20th anniversary screening of mm. Showgirls. Yes. And you could hear the crowd sounding like a stadium crowd. You could hear it underneath. <laughs> Tonight is like this magical full circle moment where I actually didn't get to experience the sweetness of a screening with a crowd that embraced it. So she, she fought for this role. She really wanted that kind of reaction. She got it, but it was delayed. It was delayed like years and years later. Is, yeah. are, we, are we saying this movie is like a very fine wine? We are. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, by the way, I just noticed you've got a very nice shirt. Um, well, who, well, a very nice shirt, by the way. Who, what, what make is it? Uh, Versace. Ah, uh, <laughs> I see. Oh, yeah, Versace. I love Versace. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I, I tried to do that with a straight face. You can't. You can't do that with a straight face. But yeah, the whole point being is like, that's the thing. It's like a very nice, fine wine in that sense. And she is the best thing in the movie, I think. She is the reason why you watch it. Yeah. Third thing. Right. Now, the third thing is whether, whether you think this is a good bit or not. Mm. The amount of nudity in this movie. There's a lot of nudity. A uh, lot of boobs. Lots of boobs. Yeah. But it, you kind of... <laughs> Once you've seen like twenty boobs, yeah. you think oh, that's enough now. You can just you have too many boobs now. This is the weird thing. Do you know? Yeah, it's like you're you're oversaturated on boobage. Yeah. And full frontal nudity, by the way, on on all the females. And you're just okay. It's like the shock value is no longer there anymore. There's no titillation. No. And all the nudity, to some degree, is surprisingly aggressive. Like, yeah. It's, you, yeah, it's aggressive nudity. Yeah, you don't actually, surprisingly, you don't come to watch this movie for the sexiness of it. There's no, the sex scenes feel weird and, yeah. and aggressive. And quite dolphin like. Well, there is, if there's anything we'll that sums, get to that. <laughs> if there's anything that sums it up is some of the sex scenes. But yeah, there's nudity in this, but the nudity, maybe it's maybe part of a degree, is because this, this is us maybe reevaluating it later, but is this on purpose? Is the fact that the sexuality in this movie isn't about being titillated and being sexy, but it's about, this movie isn't sexy, this movie is just like trying to make nudity like completely mundane or just angry that there is nudity involved in this movie, that's part of the satirical read, or is this just not, a, or is this a titillating movie that's kind of failed in doing its job? Of course, it's a very cynical movie. I mean, everybody is bad, really. There's only one uh, the African American girl uh, is the only good person in the whole movie. She's and really, she gets she's punished. Really by punished rape, yeah. Yeah. Huh? She's punished for that. Yeah, yeah she's so. punished for that. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really dark movie, I think. Because here's the thing, right? Do we? The, the idea is maybe the nudity is seen as being more empowering because it's the women getting nude for their own kind of sake. Or, but then again, there's scenes in the movie where it's men forcing the women to do things that they're not really wanting to do. Yeah. And is it the fact that now is it the men sort of forcing them to do them, or is it the women empowering the fact that no, I'm doing it because of me, not because of you? There's mm. all, this is all the satirical reading of the nudity, but really, just to, just to sum it up. There's a lot of boobs in this, yeah. <laughs> and um, the sex scenes that lead up to it, um, which I think we'll have to. I won't. We'll, I think this is a bit. The, let, let's talk about it very briefly. Yeah. Okay. So there's one particular sex scene, which is by far the funniest sex scene in the history of sex scenes, and and I mean this because I think that. Again, you can read it as sort of like a satirical thing, but if not, this is this is this has been directed by someone who has never had sex in their life. Yes. And having Elizabeth Berkeley <laughs> basically floundering in a pool like a dolphin while getting rammed yes. is the funniest thing I've ever seen. I mean, we recently got a, a cat toy for our cat that's a flipping fish. <laughs> And he literally just, he, he taps it with his paw and it goes brr, 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 and it, it flips on its own. It reminds me of this scene. Now, reeling the fun with Flippity Fish from JML. The exciting new cat toy that keeps Kitty entertained all day. Um, and it's weird. This I think that sums it up. The sex in this movie is not sexy. The nudity is not really titillating, but there's more to it. Yes. Now, number four, I think it's, uh, number four is the big one, I think. Mm. The script. Yeah, there's the like. The, I mean, the the reason I watch this movie on like repeat, like whenever I can, is the the lines, you know. <laughs> and the the good thing about it is you've got some where you kind of like you have a, a weird bit of dialogue that makes you laugh and then ruins the rest of the scene because you're laughing at that particular. But then you've got other scenes where it's like a punchline, like the the, the scene's okay dialogue wise. And they say one thing at the end, and it's like, why did you say that? Like, yes. 
there's like it's like this throughout the movie. Combine this with the weird performances where everyone's trying to take all this dialogue seriously. You got Elizabeth Berkeley who's going who's overacting immensely yeah. to some of these lines. And then you got this all together and you got this cacophony of just pure hilarity that you didn't expect. Like there are, obviously we made a joke already, but obviously uh, for Seish is a constant run on that. Yes. Um, Doggy Chow is my personal favorite. Doggy Chow. I used to love Doggy Chow. <laughs> I used to love Doggy Chow too. And the thing is, I kind of like that scene because it looks like the actors are just having a laugh and kind of like, it looks like a bit of like a blooper. Yeah. And it looks natural. Like they're actually, I think they're acting quite well in that because they're kind of giggling to the, looking at each other like this is silly, but it looks like genuine. <laughs> but it's also, but it's the weirder thing in it is what makes it funny, but also weird about it is like, the conversation's weird. Yeah, it's odd that they have to say that. It's almost like the actors are laughing at the fact they have to say this dialogue. It's almost Lynchian in a way. Mm. I've had dog food. You have? Mm-hmm. Long time ago. Doggy chow. I used to love doggy chow. <laughs> I used to love doggy chow too. Paul Verhoeven was given the script uh, from a friend. Right. The first time he read it, he literally flat out said no because he wanted to do, he wanted to focus on another project. Mm. And he flat out he said out no because he just said this is not his thing. And also kind of thought to himself like the I think he was trying to be polite, say the script's kind of bad. Right. Yeah. He turned it down because he was going to do another movie. Mm. That movie fell through, and so now he had all this free time. Yeah. He felt sorry for the friend that he ditched. So he went back to the script and said, okay, I'll do it, I guess. Uh, I used a, st a style that probably is not so well known, uh, what you would call hyperbolic. Everything being uh, over the top, the lights, the staging, the movement of the actors, everything being, being just more, just a touch more than the reality, and especially the dialogue, perhaps. Some of this, some of the lines, the twists, the performances is, weirdly out of place. Well, uh, I mean, Paul Verhoeven has, has quoted, he, he basically says that you can't blame Elizabeth Berkeley for this film, and he yeah. feels sad that she was blamed for it. Yeah. He says that it's either my fault or it's the screenwriter's fault. He, he basically said that yeah. in, in, in an interview. So He's embraced <laughs> the idea that's like, no, this isn't the actor's <laughs> fault. This is basically, I think he's saying, look, it's me mm. for accepting this job and it's also the script for me not to say no to the script. Yeah. So it's kind of like, here's the thing. So he's embraced that. And mm. I feel like, again, we're overanalyzing this, but to a degree, this is what grown the cult following, because this is number five now. Yeah. The comedic satire. Mm. So this has created a huge cult following, whether it is because it's so bad, it's good, the dialogue is, you can see it as a bad movie, but you can also see it as this has got a high level of camp, Mm. which is always pleasing for cult films. We all know that already. Yep. But the thing is, is now this movie has been, over the years, has been reevaluated, And thinking whether the script is actually smarter than it is appearing to be. But I always, I always thought that um, people were taking it much too seriously. You know what I mean? I always thought it was kind of fun and maybe over the top and kind of out there and maybe it was because it was after Basic Instinct or maybe the way it was being sold as this very serious thing. I always, I remember telling my family like, oh my God, this is gonna be so much fun. So people are thinking like, no, this, all these weird choices and all these bad choices cannot be by mistake or it cannot just be, they're just bad because of it. There's reasonings behind it. And this is what, this is why some cult films take years to get a cult following. I don't do an interview without people and a lot of the same people still asking me about Showgirls. The say, a lot of the same people who gave it negative reviews are obsessed with it all these years later. So it was kind of funny. You know, it's like, I, I don't know, I always found that kind of curious. They, it's like, well, you hate it so much, why are you still talking about it? And now it's being, oh no, but it's this great cult thing. So I don't know, it kind of taught me not to really pay too much attention to reviews so much. You know, just like we mentioned, Showgirls is like a fine wine, but not a very good fine wine. It's like, it's like, a, it's like an off-brand 
wine, but it's aged better because it's been on the shelf for a while. Yes. You know, and um, it hasn't gone to full vinegar. Mm. Oh, I don't know what that was. <laughs> Let me just say that a bit again, I'm sorry. Oh, I kind of swallowed my word there for a minute. That's a blooper. Dry throat or something. I know, I know. Right. So, mm, so. <laughs> <laughs> How weird was that? I like swallowed the word vinegar. <laughs> I keep that in. Oh, no, oh God. Maybe, maybe this is me trying to defend the movie and go like, don't, don't you dare call it vinegar. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so we had, it was it was released on vinegar syndrome. It was. It did get re a release on vinegar syndrome. It was great. But the movie hasn't gone. It ha the movie hasn't gone to vinegar, right? It hasn't just gone worse. It hasn't even. The movie doesn't even feel dated in a weird way, despite its being incredibly nineties and its aesthetic and everything else. It has aged well enough. I think at the time mm. you had Leaving Las Vegas that came out and yes. that, that was around about the same sort of time and that was actually a good, really good movie about the sleaze mm. of, of, of Las Vegas. Yeah, the sleaze and the consequence of Las Vegas. Yeah. And then around that time as well, you've got Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot of movies about the sleaze of Vegas. Yeah. Right? And so this feels weird and out of place. Yeah. It also feels like to a degree, and maybe this is both its charm and its weirdness. Mm. So Paul Verhoeven, either the script is this way or not, but whether Paul Verhoeven approached this or not, or whether the script is Paul, the movie about female empowerment also feels quite male gazy and oh, yeah. very misogynistic in its way. Okay, ladies, I got one interest here, and that's the show. I don't care whether you live or die. I want to see you dance, and I want to see you smile. I can't use you if you can't smile. I can't use you if you can't show. I can't use you if you can't sell. The way I see it is, this is why I love this movie to a degree, is that you can read a bajillion ways into this film. Mm. And all of them to some degree are both correct and absolutely wrong. Okay. <laughs> so you can go, yes, that's a reading of the movie. Yeah. And also you can say that to someone else and go, you're talking nonsense. Mm. <laughs> And I think that's what's great about Showgirls. It's a movie that still holds up despite it being a mess. I'll let everyone down! I'm so confused! There's a funny story about Cal McLaughlin, actually. Yes. Because he, I don't think he, I don't think all the actors saw any, like, rushes or something as it was going along. Like, yes. I think they just, they, they ended up seeing, like, the, 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 the final product. Yes. Because like, Cal McLaughlin had no idea it was going to be bad, right? Yeah. And he went... <laughs> When they went to see the premiere, let's see it for the first time, as a, as a package, he was watching it and he was getting that real realization. I was watching, like, oh no, I'm in a oh, bad no. movie. Oh no! <laughs> oh my gosh! How far it into happened? it at the premiere were you like, or had you seen it before? Pretty much, no. I had pretty much the first scene. I always said, okay, okay, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine going into a film that you that you starred in, mm. and 30 minutes into watching it, you suddenly get this horrible realization that it's bad. You'd have this pit in your stomach when you eat, like yeah. this. I have to mention, there is a line. Man, everybody got AIDS and shit. Everybody's got AIDS and shit, right? <laughs> it's a classic line. <laughs> and be, because of that line, it just being in my mind, yeah. in university, I wrote an essay about, uh, I was at the animation at university, and I wrote. And I had to write, write an essay about like a, a um, an animator or like a creator. And I used John Lasseter. Okay. To cut a long story short, there was a bit in the in the script, in the uh, essay, where I said something along the lines of like, I, I just want to talk about toys and shit with John Lasseter. Bitch, I'm telling you the truth. In my, ah! in my essay, <laughs> like really, realistically, like thinking that that's particular, that's fine that you can write that in an essay. You want me to go? I'm out of here. But like, I still think, reflecting back, even though it was embarrassing at the time, it's a funny that put that, that planted the seed in my head of putting that in an essay, thinking it was fine. So, in other words, Showgirls made you do badly a badly in a, in a university essay. It did make me do the next essay really well. I got <laughs> I got a really good grade on the next one that I had to do after that. So, in other words, I that, learned the lesson. So that essay is Showgirls, and then the other essay, the other essay you did after that was your Starship Troopers. Yeah. So right. it's quite a long story, but it is it is fitting. It know? is fitting indeed. <laughs> but yeah, um, 
All right, so that's Shogun. Those, those are the five and few more reasons to why we think this is a must-see movie. Um, the screening is happening very, very soon. It's happening on the 18th of November yes. over at the Quad in Derby. So please go and attend if you are in the area. We'll be, uh, um, and we'll be, and for, on that thing as usual, we usually have like a little bit of a quiz and introduce the film afterwards as well. Yes. Uh, so keep an eye out. We've got to, this season, because we be, this will be the one year anniversary we're doing this. So Showgirls is a one year anniversary of doing this, oh, which is really exciting. So we have a season two, oh, it's rip roaring and ready to go. And also, just leave something down in the comments. Uh, do you think Showgirls is a hidden masterpiece or is it absolute trash? Just leave something down below. Okay. Right. See you next time, guys. Take care. I hope to see you at the screening. Adios. Fancy supporting Retro Rewind in the best possible way? Head over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Harvey Retro and choose from two options to unlock exclusive full movie and album commentary videos by yours truly and guests, select membership and join Harvey's AV Club for three pound a month. Trivia, anecdotes and even drinking games will be on the cards with these special commentary episodes. Or if you'd rather, just say thank you without joining the club, select support and buy us a VHS tape which is a single five pound contribution. And don't forget to tell us which classic you're adding to our library, as it might inspire me to review that movie in future. And that's it.